When three men embarked upon a scheme to enrich themselves, a man would wind up dead, and all of their lives would be ruined. Thanks for joining me for Scammed, the murder of Ellis Green. In the early morning hours of April 16, 1988, a Glendale, California doctor, Richard Boggs, called 911 to report that a patient of his, Melvin Eugene Hansen, a 46-year-old businessman from Columbus, Ohio, had died of a heart attack in his office. The Harvard-educated doctor claimed that the man had just died, but police and EMT operators suspected the death was suspicious and that it had occurred much earlier. They were right. It was a scam. The dead man in Dr. Boggs' office was Ellis Green, not Melvin Eugene Hansen. Suspecting foul play, police got a search warrant for Boggs' office. They found sex toys in a few of the drawers, but no murder weapons. The police were unaware that just two weeks earlier, a Hollywood computer operator named Barry Pomeroy had presented himself at the Glendale police station to file a complaint against Dr. Boggs. He said the doctor had tried to kill him with a stun gun. Pomeroy said the doctor approached him at a West Hollywood bar called The Spike. Their conversation led to dinner and a drive to Glendale to see its new high-rise architecture. While in Glendale, the doctor said he needed to make a quick stop at his office. Once in his office, Pomeroy said the doctor approached him with his arms open in what he thought was an embrace, but instead... Boggs began to stab at the back of Pomeroy's neck with a taser. Pomeroy said, At first I thought he was, he was into something kinky, but it just became so intense, I realized that he was trying to kill me. In a panic, Pomeroy fought free. To his surprise, the doctor apologized and offered to stitch up the bloody cut on Pomeroy's neck. Boggs then persuaded Pomeroy to accept a ride home. When it landed on the district attorney's desk, They declined to file charges against the nearly 55-year-old Dr. Boggs, telling Pomeroy that Boggs had been a respected and outstanding member of the community for 20 years. Pomeroy dismissed the surreal episode, doing his best to let it go. Barry Pomeroy had no way of knowing that he had just survived a diabolical plot. Police discovered that Dr. Boggs had gone through a fairly radical change in his life, He had lost medical privileges at several hospitals where he practiced, and because of his messy divorce, he was in serious financial trouble. He had come out to his family and friends, causing a rift between himself, his wife, and children. Dr. Boggs gave the police Gene Hansen's emergency contact information he had on file. It was Gene Hansen's business partner, 25-year-old John Hawkins, who flew in from Ohio, where he and Hansen shared an active clothing business business called Just Sweats. John Hawkins was the beneficiary of Hansen's estate, which included three life insurance policies. On June 9, 1988, the insurance company asked the police, have you folks compared the crime scene photo of the deceased with any other photos of them in life? The police had not. It took them two weeks to get a copy of the driver's license of the deceased, which in California at the time had a fingerprint on it. When they made the comparison, the photos didn't match, but more alarmingly, the fingerprints didn't match. When the police reached out to the insurance company, it was too late. They had already paid Hawkins. As soon as the insurance was collected, John Hawkins went back to Ohio, leaving his convertible Mercedes top-down, keys in the ignition, at the airport parking. He had vanished. When he got back to Ohio, he abandoned his home there, took nearly a million dollars out of the Just Sweats business, and escaped. He was in such a hurry to get away that he didn't bother to collect the two other $500,000 life insurance policies that were still available. As suspicions began to rise that the man found in Dr. Boggs' office was not Mr. Hansen, police discovered that a Hollywood accountant named Ellis Green had been reported missing by his family and friends. The 32-year-old Green had gone missing around the same time of the death in Dr. Boggs' office. When the picture of Hansen was shown to Ellis Green's family, they identified him as their Ellis Green, not Gene Hansen. 
So now the police had correctly identified who the dead man was in Dr. Boggs's office, a prominent doctor in Glendale, California, but they still had no idea what in the world was going on. Police confronted Boggs with his inconsistencies, but Boggs claimed that he had been duped by the dead man. He swore that the dead man's name was Melvin Eugene Hansen. You can imagine this made the police all kinds of suspicious, so they got Boggs' call logs and found that he had been in frequent contact with Mr. Hansen's business partner, John Hawkins, a man Dr. Boggs had claimed he did not know. The police also noticed that Dr. Boggs had been in frequent contact with a man named Wolfgang von Snowden. Von Snowden's name was added to a countrywide watch list. On January 29, 1989, at Dallas International Airport, Wolfgang von Snowden was stopped by immigration, where they found $14,000 that he had failed to declare, and 13 or 14 different IDs, including the driver's license of Ellis Green. He was promptly arrested, and after a few hours in custody, he finally revealed that he was, in fact, Melvin Eugene Hansen. In spite of running a 20-store successful business, John Hawkins and Melvin Hansen had decided to run an insurance scam by using the insurance they had taken out on Hansen and then finding someone to be the dead Melvin Hansen so that the two might collect the insurance. Cremating the remains meant that any proof would literally go up in smoke. Five days after Hansen's arrest, Dr. Boggs was arrested in Glendale, California for insurance fraud, grand theft, and for the murder of Ellis Green. Once some of the pieces started to fit, the police and the DA were able to put together a more cogent theory of what was going on. It seems that Dr. Boggs had met Hansen and Hawkins as patients when they were in California. That's also when the three men began running other insurance scams like car accidents and soft tissue injury fraud. Phone records showed that the trio had been planning the scam for at least a year. As call spiked just before the failed attack on Pomeroy and before Hansen arrived in Glendale to assist with the Ellis murder. One of the noteworthy things about this case to me are all of the levels of duplicity. The real Melvin Jean Hansen was deeply in love with John Hawkins. He would have done anything for him. Even in custody, he wouldn't help himself by telling the police about Hawkins' involvement. John Hawkins was straight and a player with lots of women in and out of his life. But the impression I get is like any other good con. He was an object to be projected upon if it served his purpose. Knowing that Hansen loved him would have been very useful, and apparently it was. In some ways, Mr. Green was an easy mark. He was very drunk when Boggs and Hansen picked him up at the bar and persuaded him to come back with them to the doctor's office. Green met all the criteria. He looked enough like Hansen, and he was HIV positive, which was something that Hansen had been telling everyone that worked for him and all of his friends before he went off to California. That was part of the scam. He, in fact, told people that he was dying from AIDS, which in the middle of the 1980s or even at the end was a very plausible story, but it was not true. The other important part of the scheme was that Ellis Green was very, very drunk, making him much easier for two men to subdue. Because of the quick cremation, Ellis's manner of death is still an open question to this day. Drugs, suffocation, no one really knows for sure. I'm not sure whether it was out of vanity or desperation, but Dr. Boggs at some stage gave a television interview where he lamented the fact, and as proof of his innocence, that he hadn't fled and that he hadn't even profited from the scheme in any way. And you know, he's kind of right about that. He didn't profit because John Hawkins fled with the bulk of the money. In late November 1988, Hansen and Hawkins met up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where they had Thanksgiving dinner together. Previously, they had met in August at an airport in Las Vegas, where Hawkins had handed Hansen $85,000 in cash. In November of the same year, Hawkins had delivered $30,000 to Hansen in Miami. And soon after that, he gave him the bad news that they wouldn't be collecting the other million dollars from the two other insurance policies because the insurance company had mailed the check to Hawkins' old address 
in Ohio. He couldn't intercept it or have it rerouted. So by the time it got back to the insurance company, of course, they had heard from the police in California and the policies were canceled. Melvin Hansen used some of the money he got for fairly extensive plastic surgery, but Boggs got relatively little. From what I've read, he got somewhere between $6,000 and $50,000. In October of 1989, Dr. Richard Boggs was ordered to stand trial for nine counts, including murder, conspiracy, grand theft, fraud, and assault with a stun gun. At the time, the charge for murder for financial gain in California carried a maximum penalty of death. The handsome and charming John Hawkins fled the United States and managed to remain free for another three to four years before a young man he had been sailing with between France, Corsica, and Sardinia on a catamaran recognized him and turned him in to the police. Apparently, America's Most Wanted also ran a story about the Dr. Boggs case and the murder of Ellis Green, and one of Hawkins' many girlfriends in the United States also identified him. Hawkins was arrested on the $30,000 catamaran that he had purchased and named Carpe Diem. In 1991, the 29-year-old was placed under arrest and held in a Sardinian jail. It would take several years to get him back to the United States for trial. But at each of their trials, Hansen and Hawkins admitted that they had committed insurance fraud by paying Dr. Boggs $50,000 for a body, but they didn't kill anyone. You know, as I was writing this part of this story, I thought to myself, these guys wanted the jury to believe, like in Victorian England, that they were just scouting around for a doctor who would hand over a corpse. And as I was writing this, I read something, an interview with Mr. Hawkins, and he said exactly that. According to him, that's as far as the scheme went. In 1990, Richard Boggs was found guilty of fraud, grand theft, and conspiracy to commit murder. Somewhere along the way, the death penalty had been taken off the table. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. On January 2, 1992, while waiting deportation, Hawkins tried to escape his Cagliari jail in Sardinia, but he was caught in the courtyard. After an extradition wrangle, Hawkins was returned to the United States, put on trial, and in 1994, he was found guilty of fraud and conspiracy, but not the murder. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison. He was released in 2014 after serving 20 years. In 1995, Melvin Eugene Hansen was found guilty of fraud, grand theft, and conspiracy to commit murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. I couldn't verify whether he is still alive. He would be in his 80s. In the end, investigators were only able to recover $150,000 of the million-dollar insurance payout. It was found parked in Hansen and Hawkins' company, Just Sweats. The 22-store franchise had been forced to file for bankruptcy after Hawkins and Hansen had raided its coffers a few years earlier. In March of 2003, 69-year-old Richard Boggs died from a heart attack while serving his life sentence at Corcoran State Prison. He had been diagnosed with terminal pancreatic cancer at the time of his death. He still had a few supporters and former patients who he'd called collect and diagnosed their symptoms over the prison phone, which is sort of sweet and creepy and sad all at the same time, I think. In the press, Ellis Green has often been treated like a victim, yes, but also a drunk gay guy whose death was, you know, kind of his fault. But from what I've read, Green was a smart and sweet man who moved from Ohio to Los Angeles where he was living with his aunt and working as an accountant. One of his friends said that when he drank, he got a little depressed, so he wasn't worried when he didn't hear from him at first. But when he missed work, his friends reported him missing to the police. Green's friend said that Green had a hard time handling little upsets, but if someone had a major problem or crisis, like finding out that they were HIV positive, Green was steady as a rock. Ellis Green grew up in eastern Ohio in the village of Powhatan. He dropped out of high school and joined the Army, but was soon discharged. 
because his relatives said it wasn't for him. He moved to Los Angeles to live his life more fully as a gay man. He managed to survive being HIV positive in the 1980s, which was no small feat, only to be murdered for money by other gay men who he barely knew. I think his life should be celebrated and his name not forgotten, dragged under by the gaudy weight of the scam that took his life. Thanks for joining me. If you haven't already, please subscribe and like the video. Thanks again. See you next time.